Welcome one, welcome all to Talos and Meditations. This is the, I guess it's fortnightly uh, community call that Talisman run uh, to go over a few Talisman updates and invite ecosystem teams to uh, chat about what they're doing in the Paraverse uh, and how Polkadot enjoyers can use their products and features um, on their travels around the Paraverse. And today we're pretty lucky to have uh, Lol McShiz, uh, I think, is the is your yes, you said it right. This evening, <laughs> uh, who is the ecosystem lead at HydroDX? Hey, everybody! Thanks for having me on. I'm a, uh, a an alpha talisman enjoyer. Awesome. Um, we'll get started right away with the, with the AMA and jump into it. And first of all, uh, can you introduce yourself? Uh, how did you arrive at being the ecosystem lead at HydroDX slash Basilisk? What was the journey? Yeah, sure. So for me, uh, I've only been in uh, the space really for two, three years now. Um, I was basically, uh, prior to this, I was sort of commercial lead for a food manufacturer. So absolutely nothing to do with tech or crypto or anything like that, or even money, really. Um, so I would dabble in some stocks and shares and things in my free time. And then I came across this interesting company in the UK that mined Bitcoin. And I was like, well, what does that even mean? Like, how can you mine something that's not physically there? So um, went down this journey of discovering that, got super interested, found another uh, listed company called KR1, which uh, is, a, is a big polka dot uh, investor um you know uh been involved in fundraising on loads of different parachains in the in the ecosystem so i sort of like really dabbled down into all of the projects that they invest in and one of those was hydro dx which i just thought was super interesting um so i just became a a, a basilisk and hydro dx enjoy all um and yeah through weeks and months of uh posting online uh just sort of got uh super close in the community and then yeah the sort of january february time last year they asked me if i fancy coming on board and and working with them so uh yeah that's how i sort of came to to join uh the hydra guys and yeah love and life since awesome uh so it sounds like a really organic um journey into web3 and what was the project hydra ds Hydro DX slash Basilisk at uh, when you first heard about them? So when I first heard about them, I still had a sort of very limited understanding of what they were trying to do. Um, and I guess had to go on a bit of a baptism of fire learning journey to understand everything about uh, liquidity and, and, and everything like that. But TLDR on what Hydro DX is and, and obviously Basilisk uh, as a, as a, brother chain to hydro dx you know it's a parachain secured by polka dot that is dedicated to the sole purpose of providing the most capital efficient swaps possible right so our key feature is the hydro dx omnipool uh, which is uh, a reimagining of the conventional uniswap style decks you know of, of paired assets in pools so instead of having lots of different pools we just put it all in a single pool the omnipool um so this allows you to use the same, for example, dot liquidity against all other assets instead of fragmenting it over, over multiple pools. So um, there's a meme I really enjoy on this where, you know, don't mid curve it and, and talk through over the top complexities of why you need multiple pools and everything. Just put all assets in one pool and it's uh, much more efficient, right? So um, we've got a whole host of additional other features we're building over the sort of coming months and years to build on this foundation but ultimately we want to become the swap the, the, the hub or the home for any two swaps to take place right just um super efficient super sustainable um and basilisk is an important part of that package where um you've got sort of like different uh, stages of the tokens life cycle right you've got the initial launch and the, the price discovery and those early days of trading which are most likely to be volatile and then you've got the, the period of time where you've got greater liquidity and you just need the efficient swaps as possible, right? So Basilisk deals with the former part of that with our LVP allowing you to, to launch. 
um, and your, your conventional Uniswap style um, swaps uh, on the XYK AMM decks um, to, to sort of deal with that initial part of the of the life cycle. Currently, there's a slight disjoint between the two because Basilisk is on Kusama and uh, HydroDX is on Polkadot, and, and at the moment we're waiting for that uh, that bridge hub to go live to connect the two. Okay, so there's a little bit to unpack there. You have two chains. Uh, firstly, a parachain on Kusama called Basilisk, and this deals with liquidity bootstrapping and then some swapping functionality. And then the parachain on Polkadot called HydroDX is this app chain that specializes in kind of really capital efficient swaps powered by an omni pool, where instead of having to kind of fragment liquidity across lots of different pairs to create kind of trading routes, everything is in one big bucket. Is that is that a fair summary? Yeah, that's that's bang on. I might actually record that and uh, use that next time. <laughs> I believe this this space will be recorded, uh, so it's there for you. Um, but I'm kind Perfect. of interested to dive. Awesome. I'm kind of interested to dive into this Omni pool. Uh, I'm going to assume that everyone here is familiar with the mechanics and I guess the pricing curves or, or however, however you understand the Uniswap kind of paired model of an AMM. Uh, so it would be really great if you could kind of juxtapose that with how the Omnipool works and how a swap is kind of processed in this model where there isn't a, like a one-to-one -one or a one-to-two relationship between the amount of assets in a pool to determine the price. Yeah, sure. So the simplest way to imagine it is if it's uh, a whole ton of mini Uniswap pools of each asset against our hub token, which is Learner. So in the Omnipool, 50% of all the liquidity is Learner. Now, this is our hub token, which is minted and burned as liquidity is added or removed from the Omnipool. So let's say I have I add $1 million worth of DOT because I'm a whale into the Omnipool. The protocol will mint $1 million equivalent worth of learner to match it. So the easiest way, because we're just used to this model now, is to think of it as a ton of little tiny pools which all have learner against the other asset. So what actually happens rather than, so for example, um, some normal Uniswap pools uh, or DEXs will allow you to hop between pools. So um, rather than doing these sort of pool hops, which incur lots of different trading uh, fees each time you go into a different pool, it will route through Learner to the other asset. So if I want to swap, for example, DOT to HDX, you can think of it almost as a DOT to Learner to Learner to HDX trade, right? now. Because we're built on Polkadot and in Substrate, obviously it's not doing each of those hops, it's just routing through Learner and it's executed as a single trade. But that's the easiest way to imagine it, how it, how it functions. Okay, gotcha. Uh, so under the hood, uh, I guess there is like a separate deposit address for each of the assets that the Omnipool supports. And you could almost think of that as like, that's just the pool of liquidity that's available to the user. So it's actually all it is actually all in one address. Uh, so it's all at the Omnipool address, and you can see it on um, Subscan, for example. It's it's all the same address, um, but any assets that are in that address are in the Omnipool. Um, so Learner is in there, as with everything else. Um, but in terms of how the swaps function between assets, it's it's easier to imagine it as a load of little pools, even though that's not the case. Okay, cool. I understand. Um... So then what makes this Omnipool really special or kind of significant for users? Uh, you said at the start of the call that it was really capital efficient. Um, could you maybe dive into how that kind of plays out uh, compared to like a Uniswap model uh, and maybe some of the, um, the usability problems or, or obstacles that, that a user might face with that, like in permanent loss? Yeah, so... Um... With uh, the with the Omnipool, so let's say for example, I had ten million dollars worth of DOT liquidity that I wanted to provide uh, in a normal Uniswap Dex, and I wanted to pair that against 
uh, or I want that to, to to feed liquidity against you know Bitcoin wrapped ETH HDX whatever. So you would have to split that ten million dollars worth of Dai across each of those pools. Now it doesn't mean that you would literally need to have dot in every single one of those pools. As I mentioned, you can you know use an order router to to hop between those. But each hop you do, you have to pay additional fees for, right? So you would need to split that liquidity in some way in order to be able to trade one asset for any other asset. So you're breaking down that $10 million worth. Let's say you had five pools that you split it across. You've got $2 million worth of DOT effectively against any of those assets. In the Omnipool, you just provide $10 million worth of DOT to the Omnipool, and that full liquidity is available for swapping against any of those other assets. So it only takes a few assets. Say, for example, if you did the same for to Bitcoin and ETH, then you've all of a sudden got the, the, the efficiency of trades of trading $10 million against $10 million, which means price impact is exceptionally low. Whereas when you're on a conventional DEX, you're having to hop between pools and split that liquidity. So you're at most getting benefit of $2 million worth. And is this kind of Omnipool model something that, you would have been able to implement with a system of smart contracts like Uniswap was first deployed on Ethereum? Or is it something that was only kind of made available uh, when you're subscribing to the app chain thesis, uh, where you kind of have control over producing the blocks uh, in a way that a parachain does? Yeah, so our full imagined uh, ultimate final form of Omnipool is only possible um, with with Substrate, where you can you can dictate what happens with the blocks, right? So the, the idea of an Omnipool, uh, whilst we first imagined it and we're in research phase, et cetera, um, you would have seen that Bancor did their own version of it. Um, however, the, the way that they uh, implemented it with uh, the, the, the Bancor token as a, as a sort of hub token, um, yeah, led to ultimately to some sort of um, death spiral when prices got bad. They also promised impotent loss protection and, and things like that, which just, uh, yeah, the tokenomics weren't, weren't weren't good in that case, right? But in terms of the Omnipool, so we, we launched the version one in January and it was sort of, we considered that as training wheels version. Um, very, very simple uh, bootstrap version. And then as time has gone on and as time continues to go on, we've added significant other features, which you can't ordinarily do. So let's, uh, for example, um, it, it, currently we're working on an XEM rate limiter, right? Um, so we can dictate what assets can come on, uh, onto HydroDX chain or leave HydroDX chain over a certain period of time based on volatility, for example. So if we say it's ordinary for us to see a thousand ETH flow in and out of the chain every day, then a thousand ETH can flow in and out of the chain absolutely fine. If there's some huge DPEG event somewhere and somebody then tries to get 100,000 ETH out of the chain, then the rate limiter would allow that to sort of be spread out over a larger period of time and give enough time for human intervention um, to, to target some of those functions specifically, um, governance to react, etc. cetera. Um, so that's not possible outside of your own um, app-specific chain. But also those allow us to implement features such as um, dynamic fees, uh, dynamic trade fees, which hoping to ship soon. Um, so again, we've got our own oracles based on uh, the Omnipool. So all of the volatility or the volume and price data feeds into our own oracles, which then feed all of the other features. So dynamic fees. So when things get really volatile, ordinarily LPs get wrecked, right? Because uh, toxic asset flow. Dynamic fees will scale the trading fees in the favor of the LP when things get really bad, right? So it incentivizes LPs to stay more sticky liquidity. So we, you can think of it as sort of, you've got the version one Omnipool, and then you've got all these different Lego brick accompaniments that we're adding, which make it more efficient, safer, um, and uh, easier to use um, you know, new ways of trading um, such as like programmable um, averaging over X number of blocks. Um, so that there's a whole load of additional things that you can keep adding that, that, that make it even better. Cool. Um, I'm actually kind of interested to dig into these 
dynamic fees. Uh, am I correct in understanding that it's almost a way for, it, it incentivizes the liquidity providers to stick around in times of volatility by making it more expensive to perform a swap uh, and then that provides like better guarantees on the amount of liquidity in the system and the capital efficiency of the Omnipool. Absolutely. So you can think of it as in, you know, on a centralized exchange, you've got market makers who are providing your spread. Um, and as soon as the going gets tough, they rub the liquidity, right? Uh, and then everybody gets greater price impact. You have your liquidation cascades and everything gets super hairy. Um, Obviously, Omnipool itself, with our protocol and liquidity, which I guess is another matter, uh, will never rug the liquidity. It's always there. Um, but what the um, what the dynamic fees do is essentially they allow the spread to sort of widen for passive LPs without them having to actually act on it. So if, for example, you'd normally have uh, a 0.25% LP fee, you know, that could scale up if you have really high volatility to, you know, one, two, three, four percent. I mean, who knows? You know, when, when prices are going super manic, um, they could they could scale significantly. But yeah, that that encourages them to stay because they know that they're at least going to make bank on on the fees. And, and you can see when you look at um, data of performance of LPs on you know, the, the, you know Uniswap v two, Uniswap v three, etc. It's typically during these periods of intense volatility that they get wrecked, uh, and there's almost no coming back from that whereas the dynamic fees will help to level the playing field a bit there. Okay, so the, the theme here is really that HydroDX is providing uh, a source of really deep liquidity for the ecosystem. You know, firstly, with trying to mitigate and permanent loss with the learner token and the Omnipool model. Secondly, with these dynamic fees to incentivize liquidity providers to stick around. Um, is this kind of depth of liquidity the... Um, the goal or like the uh, the north star for the project so yes and no so we we obviously want super deep liquidity but it sort of comes almost to a, a a limit of what you actually need for useful liquidity right um so unless you're wanting to um accommodate million dollar swaps with zero slippage you know you don't need to actually go for the mad tvl numbers so this is something i've been thinking is quite interesting recently typically your decks it's TVL wars, right? Like the decks with the biggest TVL is the is the big daddy. That's where you go for your swaps. But Omnipool doesn't necessarily need that because you don't need 20 pools with $10 million worth of dot in each of those. You just have $10 million worth of dot, right? So you can you can provide the, the sort of efficiency on swaps at much lower numbers. So you don't have to pump those rookie numbers up, right? That being said, we obviously do want it to be deep enough so that people can commit swaps uh, in, in an efficient way. Uh, but also there's other ways of doing it that we can do because we have our own blockchain, right? So the DCA palette that we're uh, set to launch, hopefully soon, TM, um, sort of has two features out of it. So you've got a, a normal scheduler. So I could schedule, I want to swap, uh, you know, I want to buy $100 worth of DOT every hour or every day or whatever. Um, which is a fairly conventional way that people sometimes like to manage their wages, right? You know, they might have some savings they want to do, so they might want to buy uh, every few weeks uh, a certain asset or something. So it helps to automate that, which is typically allowed only for users of centralized exchanges. But also the, the one I'm more interested in is uh, it's more like a, a TWAP model, a uh, time-weighted average uh, price sort of um, model, which we're, uh, you, we like to call smart split swap. Um, but essentially that is, let's say I want to swap um, 10,000 DAI into DOT, which at the moment, based on the liquidity we've got, would, it, would, it, would incur 2.67% price impact. What the smart split swap would allow you to do is tick a little button uh, or a little switch, which will calculate for you what is the most efficient way for you to actually swap that. So it might then say, right, instead of doing one 10,000 DAI to DOT swap, we're going to do a thousand swaps over the next twelve hours of ten die to dot, um, which will basically give you zero percent price impact. Yes, you'll pay more in fees, but when you're in an environment that's got less than one cent swaps, you know that's what ten dollars of fees versus two hundred and fifty dollars worth of price impact if you just did it in one. Um, so again, it's another way that you can trade in shallower liquidity with 
without without that same sort of price impact. Cool. Um, if I was to use this TWAP feature when it's released in the future, and I'm almost broadcasting to the network that I'm going to be submitting lots of swaps over the next 12 hours, does that present a front-running opportunity for somebody to kind of uh, sandwich those transactions that are maybe definitely going to happen? Yes and no. Yes, if you, for example, I say, right, okay, I want to schedule 10,000 die a month, and I want to do it as a monthly swap. Like, yes, you're probably going to get wrecked, right? Like, if you if you put that in, then you broadcast to everybody, I'm going to do this one swap once a month. Um, now, there are, when you're setting it up, you are setting your own slippage limitations, etc. So if, for example, you put on there, right, 0.5% price impact is that, or slippage is the, the, the most I'm willing to accept, uh, then the transaction will simply fail and reschedule if uh, someone tries to, to sandwich you on it, right? But the, the, the important thing with the TWAP is that you wouldn't be doing a massive transaction, right? So if you're doing instead a thousand 10 die to dot swaps, right? For someone to sandwich you, they're gonna have to manipulate the price over an extended period of time and it's going to cost them more to do so, and they're going to get nothing from it because the, the actual transactions that they're sandwiching are tiny, right? So there's there's no profitability there. Um, and you have to imagine that as volume in the Omnipool scales and scales, it becomes increasingly harder to do so. Um, so the, the TWAP actually helps as a form of uh, sandwich attack mitigation because the transactions are so small and spread out. Right, so it's just not lucrative to, to even attempt to do that. Um, but is is MEV and, and sandwich attacks something that you guys are kind of uh, looking at as, as mitigating in the future, or is it something that you think is part and parcel of hosting an AMM uh, and it act, it's actually a source of uh, volume? No, it is absolutely something that we um, that we are looking at and we take seriously, uh, which is why we, um, you know, in the in the DAP, for example. We have standard uh, settings when it comes to slippage protection and, and things like that. But in terms of how to mitigate it, we've actually got several features on the roadmap which will help to, uh, well, annihilate it essentially. So one of those is um, batch ordering. So all transactions going into a block and being executed against one another before actually trading in the, in the pool. So let's say, for example, I have a $100 swap in one direction and a hundred dollar in the opposite direction of the same asset, then it will just net zero against each other and there'll be no price impact at all. Um, and it hasn't even had to touch the, the, the pool, right? So that, that transaction is like that, you, you can't sandwich because you're just gonna, it's, it's all modeled in the block together um, and, and that would wreck you. Um, but also uh, sort of more, more exciting, more cool. Um, Jacob's recently been talking about um, back running of transactions. So um, auctioning off the right to sort of reverse sandwich attacks. So let's say, for example, in a transaction, there's a 2% price impact. Um, obviously, we don't live in a silo where we're the only environment for these prices to occur. So there's an external market. And therefore, if there's a, an opportunity there for them to arbit, they can arbit in the same block, uh, which means obviously the price is always netted out. Um, so there's effectively zero price impact on the Omnipool. Uh, which means that again, you can't you can't um, sandwich it without wrecking yourself because the the uh, back runner will will close it out before you can sandwich. Okay, so that's a little that's kind of a more uh, generic and catch all solution than uh, actually just matching orders where you're dependent on the volume that's kind of incoming in that block to to see if uh, that transaction can uh, avoid MEV. Yeah. So the the um, the two features combined sort of becomes then you've got the Omni pool, which is your conventional, well, not conventional, I remember, it's more conventional, right? It's, it just sits there, it's, it's passive. And then every block almost has its own mini order book. And if, if, if they can't net each other off, then it will then trade into the Omni pool. Um, but also then the back runner can, can behave as just in time liquidity as well, right? So you sort of got a trifecta there of, of different types of, of, of swap uh, or price guarantee there that, that can make sure that you get the most efficient one possible. Got it. Uh, and then something else that I saw in your roadmap, which can maybe go away towards providing a price guarantee, is uh, stable swap pools. Is that something that you want to talk about? 
Yeah, absolutely. So uh, this, uh, this is one of those ones that's uh, implemented on, on the back end, ready to go. and uh, has been for a while. It's just uh, sitting and waiting for the, the audit stamp of approval, right? Um, but yeah, what, what we want to do with the stable swap pools is essentially everybody knows if you want to swap DAI for USDT or if you want to swap wrapped Bitcoin for you know, IBTC in our, in our pool, for example, um, then you expect those assets to be able to trade one for one, right? So you, you don't want to be getting max uh, price impact every time you, you trade anything. Um, but obviously we've got the Omni pool where all assets are in the same pool and it goes on a normal XYK AMM the swaps. So what we decided to do again, because we've got our own blockchain and we just can, um, is we made the stable swap palette, which will use a curve like uh, AMM for pegged assets. So let's say uh, we have USDT, USDC, soon TM, and DAI um, in the Omni pool. Instead, we'll move those to the stable swap pool so that they can trade against each other with this, um, with this curve um, AMM. And then those share tokens as you get in a, in, a, in a curve pool, they can then be deposited into the Omni pool, which means that you get the benefit of if you're making a trade in our DAP for, you know, between two pegged assets, then you'll get the, the benefit of next to no price impact, right? If you want to do a stable coin for a different asset, like HDX in the Omni pool, then it will smart route between the two because the essentially it will make a, 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 a paired swap of stable coin for asset shares and then the asset shares for the uh, HDX. Um, so you get the benefit of the liquidity that, that the, the curve pool will bring because people love to um, LP in, in those big stable pools. And then you, you get the benefit of the seamless swaps in the Omni pool. So you get dynamic curving almost depending on what it is that you're swapping and what's most efficient. Okay, awesome. And that's going to be released kind of pending the audit. Basically, yeah. <laughs> Once you get the, the rubber, rubber stamp of approval and uh, obviously any, any changes on uh, any, anything on there, then it's yeah, basically ready to go. Um, so yeah, when, when that's done, we'll obviously announce accordingly. Um, and then yeah, you can expect uh, our stable coins will be in a stable pool together. Don't forget we've got wrapped Bitcoin and IBTC. Uh, so I'd expect to see them in there. And then we've got this interesting dynamic at the moment in the ecosystem, right, where you've got a bunch of different bridges for a bunch of different versions of the same asset. So uh, you consider Ethereum, we've got wrapped Ethereum wormhole through Akala. There's wrapped Ethereum wormhole through Moonbeam, which are different assets. Uh, we'll have Snowbridge wrapped Ethereum. Um, and, and the list goes on. I think there's some more coming through with Bridge Hub as well. So uh, you have the potential here to almost form a, a hub between the different versions of things. Ultimately, which of those we would onboard onto HydroDX is is up for debate because obviously the, the, the caveat is that you're then exposed to more bridges, as it were. Um, but that's a, a really interesting use case for, for the sub pools is that you can, no matter where, You've sort of onboarded the liquidity from. You've you've got an option for swapping it out to whatever it is that you like. Yeah, and HydroDX is very well integrated with HRMP channels to other parachains. If you did want to bridge that liquidity out uh, to use another parachain or application. Yeah, we've recently opened quite a few um, more on the way, hopefully. But yeah, we've we've got channels open now uh, with Akala, Interlay, Zeitgeist, Astar, Centrifuge. Um, we've got Bifrost, um, Moonbeam one currently ongoing, um, and, and more hopefully down the, down the track. So, uh, yeah, the, 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 the connections are growing. Uh, lovely. And users can access those channels, uh, on the HydroDX app, uh, if you're connecting with Talisman uh, and also on the Talisman web app, I believe. Uh, so there are a few places which you can make sure that liquidity is bridged across. Absolutely. Lovely. So there's one more question or kind of topic that I want to touch on on the Omni pool before we move on to Basilisk and a couple of other items. And that was something that you mentioned earlier about Bancor. Uh, you said that Bancor was kind of like an early smart contract implementation of the Omni pool model on Ethereum. Uh, but then when kind of 
prices tanked, the tokenomics model almost fell apart a little bit. Uh, I would love to learn more about that and how uh, with the learner to with the learner token model, uh, you guys have kind of tried to mitigate against uh, whatever happened with Bancor. Um, but initially, I'd, I'd really love to to get the take on on what occurred with that project. Yeah, so uh, their biggest mistake was that they um, they used the Bancor token as their hub token. Okay, well that's what the one of their, the 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 major errors in this. Um, so we we made the decision um, it, uh, about two years ago, maybe eighteen months, um, to split it from HDX as the network token and Learner as the hub token. Um, the, the main reason being that they were, for example, providing liquidity incentives in the Bancor token, which is also the token that all the assets were paired against. So you're providing this. Um, price deflationary force to the, the token that's paired against everything else, right? So straight away, that's a recipe for disaster when it comes to impermanent loss. And then on top of that, they guaranteed 100% of your, of your impermanent loss was covered or protected um, under certain conditions. You know, you'd have to lock it up for a certain amount of time, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but what that meant is that when prices started going haywire and impermanent loss was increasing, the, the price of Bancor was dropping because they were obviously incentivizing all these assets and it, the value of it was dropping, which means they were then incentivizing more of it for the assets. And then they were protecting against this impermanent loss. So they were printing a lot of Bancor uh, token to, um, to pr protect against this impermanent loss. Uh, but that meant that the price of Bancor was then going down more. So there was more impermanent loss. And <laughs> so it was just a, a, a death spiral. And they, in the end, they had to turn off the impermanent loss protection. Um, and then they were left in a state for a while. I don't know where it's sitting at at the moment, but they're left in a state where uh, the the way they managed it is they almost had vaults, I believe, of uh, the sort of token pairs against Bancor. And they were left where the, the ETH that they had wasn't actually backed in the vault with the same amount of ETH. So there was a huge discount uh, on all the assets. Um, and yeah, that was super bad. We actually wrote a, a blog about uh, some of these incidents. Uh, so there was the, the, the Bancor, there was the, the Lunar Death Spiral, um, slight mention on the, the AUSD DPEG and things like that. So we've reflected on all of these whilst building the protocol. So first of all, we split out Learner, the hub token against HDX. So any um, you know speculative impact on on HDX or liquidity mining rewards or or anything like that is not going to impact the performance of the Omni pool. And secondly, we don't provide guarantees against impermanent loss, right? So if you suffer from impermanent loss through single sided liquidity uh, under certain conditions, you will receive an amount of learner, um, which you can obviously buy back more of the asset that you've suffered impermanent loss on or diversify into something else, whatever you want to do. Um, but that's not a guarantee of impermanent loss protection, right? Like impermanent loss is something that we just have to accept in this space that it exists, but we can do everything we can to mitigate it, to reduce it, um, to incentivize sticking around. Um, so we spoke earlier about fees quite a lot. Um, in the Omnipool, we have... Uh, there's two elements to the trade fee. So it's a 0.3% trade fee, as you'd get pretty much everywhere else. 0.25% um, is the asset or LP fee, which goes to the liquidity providers. And then 0.05% of every swap is what we call the protocol fee. Now that is paid in learner on every trade. And then depending on the state of the Omnipool, uh, that protocol fee will use, be used in a different way. So at the moment, the, uh, let's say uh, some people have suffered from some impermanent loss and they've received an amount of learner. They sell that learner back into the Omnipool. That creates a, a sort of a bit of a uh, disparity between what the Omnipool would consider as the ideal price for learner, um, all other things considered, and the, and the current price. So what it will then do in that case is it will take all of that protocol fee and it will burn it. And it will keep burning it until it's burnt two times the amount that was sold back into the Omnipool. So essentially what that provides is that with more volume and more time, it, it sort of causes mean reversion of this uh, learner token. So we're incentivizing LPs to, to stick around, to not jump at the first hurdle because you, you have these, these rushes 
uh, of liquidity for the exit door. And that's when everybody then gets wrecked with the most impermanent loss, right? Um, and the other protective measure is protocol and liquidity. So the Omnipool isn't a trader. The Omnipool isn't going to try and rug liquidity uh, when, when things get tough. It's just there as almost like a liquidity provider of last resort. Um, at the moment, it's sort of the vast majority of our liquidity, um, which means that it's sort of fairly, um, you, you can rely on the only pool to not, to not pull that um, liquidity. So there's, there's a number of things there which are done differently, whether it's splitting out the, the assets, whether it's not guaranteeing impermanent loss protection, um, and then the, the sort of mean reversion protocol fee burning side of it as well. Okay, uh, there's probably a, a lot to cover there, but I guess I have two questions. Firstly, with this protocol fee, you mentioned that was denominated in the learner token. Does that mean that users that want to perform a swap on the army pool need to hold learner uh, in order to interact and exchange some assets? No, no. It's um, so because um, so when I mentioned before that you've uh, is you can think of it as all these little sub pools, right, of an asset against learner. So when you trade, let's say you swap DOT for HDX and you do $10 worth. So you're moving, you're putting in $10 of learner on one side, sorry, what of an asset in one side, and you're taking $10 of another asset from the other side. When you're doing that, you're then imbalancing those pools with respect to learner, right? Because you'll have $10 too much in one and $10 too little on the other. So what the protocol will do is it will move the learner to the, the correct sub pool. And that learner that is moved, it, 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 it takes the protocol fee from, from that piece. So no, the user doesn't need to have learner to perform any swap. And in fact, on HydroDX, the, the user doesn't actually have to have any particular token to do any swap or any transaction, right? So you can pay asset on any fee that's accepted on the, on the platform. Anything that's on our asset registry is a fee payment asset. So you can change that in the wallet settings at, at any time. Uh, which makes things obviously super convenient. Um, so no, you don't have to have learner. You don't have to have any particular token. Um, the, the fees will just work themselves out in the back. Lovely. Uh, and I guess that's the same mechanism, or, or you can use the Omni pool to uh, pay in whichever token you have when you're performing the swap. So the network needs to receive HDX eventually, but if you're going to be paying in DOT to receive, I don't know, the Zeitgeist token, uh, then that DOT, a small portion of that will be swapped for HDX for the network. So for the transaction fees, um, it doesn't actually do a swap. So different um, chains are implementing it differently. So I believe um, Interlay at the moment are, uh, and Akala have already uh, implementing it in a way where it does swap to the native token. Um, yeah. But actually, no, we, we, we don't do it that way. We, uh, it purely the, um, the treasury will take whatever. Treasury is not fussy. Um, he's happy to receive payment in HDX. It will basically use the spot price of uh, the Omnipool to determine what that swap rate is. Um, or it will have a fallback, which we've got in the, in the asset registry. Um, but yeah, it will essentially, let's say that the fee is normally 1.5 HDX, but I'm, my fee payment asset is set to DOT. It will um, send 1.5 HDX worth of DOT to the, the Treasury. Understood. Um, and out of interest, is the fees kind of collected by the treasury? Could they then be used uh, as the protocol provided liquidity in the future? If the treasury has accumulated some kind of holding of dot, uh, could the treasury later decide to provide that as the as the like yeah Omnipool provided liquidity? Absolutely. Yeah. And and, and the protocol the HDX holders are. Um, essentially the controllers of the treasury, right? It's all on-chain controlled. Um, so those fees are always amassing in the um, in, in the treasury. I say amassing, but <laughs> as you know, transaction fees on uh, on our networks are all super small. Um, so uh, the actual amounts are, are relatively um, insignificant at the moment. Um, but yeah, over time, of course, and as networks get busier, as they reach critical mass, um, you can expect those to pile up. So yeah, in, in theory, all transaction fees ultimately could lead to more and more and more and more liquidity um, uh, as, uh, as time goes on. Lovely. Um, let's switch gears to Basilisk, your Kusama parachain, uh, which you described at the start of the call as 
kind of a platform for a lot of pre IDO activities where you'll be able to list a token in an LBP. And then there is some uh, swapping functionality there as well. Uh, did you want to give a summary of what's currently deployed on Basilisk? Yeah, sure. So um, to date, we've run a single uh, LBP, um, which was um, for the Tinkerdep uh, Tinker token, uh, which we ran uh, a few months ago now. Um, and essentially, uh, if you don't know, the, the LBP um, is uh, a way for you to launch trading of an asset with it and discover its price without loads of upfront capital. So typically, you launch a Uniswap pool, you provide 50% of one side, 50% of the other. Um, now, usually when you're launching, you have a lot of your own native token, right? And you do the tokenomics and you decide how much you need to have for liquidity or, or whatever. So let's say you have... Um, you, you want to launch a pool with $50,000 worth of your native token at a price you determine. Well, guess what? You've got to provide it $50,000 worth of another token to launch with, which when you're starting up, maybe you don't have. Um, or if you do have, maybe you don't want to spend it on that. So uh, the OBP allows you to launch with severely imbalanced pools, right? So you could have 95% of your native token and 5% of, of another asset. Now, the idea is that you set the price at a multiple of what you would expect it to be. Now, obviously, nobody knows what the price is going to end up as because it all depends on supply and demand as with anything, but you set, I don't know, 10 times what you'd expect the price to level out at. And then over time, those pools rebalance throughout the, the time of the LBP. Now, if um, somebody comes in and, and buys something after the price has moved down somewhat, then that will reflect and you'll see the price go up a little bit. But until the end of the LBP, that will keep shifting down and down and down. So you have this interesting um, game theory of you want to leave it because you don't want to be paying silly prices at the uh, at the top. Um, but likewise, if you leave it too late and there's a lot of interest for the token, then it's going to take off. So it's really interesting for finding price discovery because you, you get people buying at a level that they find acceptable. Um, which is super exciting. And then at the end of the pool, at the end of the LVP, you have 50-50 weighted pools, which can then be converted to a normal uh, XYK pool. So that's what Tinkernet did. Um, so you can find on um, SnakeSwap, you've got a, a Tinker BSX pool and a Tinker KSM pool. Um, and the majority of the liquidity in those is actually owned by the by the Tinkernet guys because um, they, they put that up front uh, at the start. So that's the sort of like cool feature uh, that we that we have that allows you to start that journey and then you've got your conventional xyk pools um so our own uh, basilisk token is available in there we've also got uh usdt ksm uh xrt robonomics um and and tinker um and i mentioned earlier about order routing that you can have we, we have that also in um in basilisk so you can swap any of those assets for each other and the the, the order router works out the best way to to do that. And for the future of Basilisk, are you planning to lean more into the LBPs and kind of incentivize or, or promote more tokens there initially? Uh, or are you going to lean into the XYK kind of order routing AMM functionality that you just spoke about? Well, they sort of go hand in hand, right? So we're, we're, obviously at the moment, the, the interest in uh, external teams and, and the likes is in Omnipool because it's so efficient and single-sided liquidity and, and everything like that. Um, but it requires that the, the token's been through price discovery and that it's sufficiently distributed, right? Um, so that everyone can't just dump all on their heads. Now, um, Basilisk, because it takes part of the, the, the early part of that journey, um, whether or not LBP or XYK pools will depend on whether or not they've launched the token, right? So LBP is your price discovery mechanism. You can't use it if you've already got uh, price for the token because it just doesn't work because you've already got a price uh, you need to not have external supply of the asset because if you think about it it starts with a high price and goes towards a low price everyone's incentivized to giga doom put the start um, so you just have it you know that um, that that youtube video where uh, squid games rugged you basically have one of those moments where it's just like oh and it's gone straight to zero um, so you can't have a an external supply of liquidity um, for that. So um, in terms of which we promote, you know, it really depends on the on the project and the stage of its life. So the idea is that Basilisk and HydroDX together can deal with 
the liquidity requirements of a project, regardless of where it is. Um, but obviously, at the moment, they're living in silos because of the uh, lack of a bridge between the two. Right. I understood. Uh, I think we could talk about this all day, uh, but I'm going to cap it here, uh, not only because we're running out of time, but also because, Lol McShiz, you'll be one of the speakers at Polka Defiance next week, uh, which is an online uh, conference run by Equilibrium, Talisman, and Parity, and it's going to be occurring on May 25th at 4 p.m. CET. Could you please give a bit of a preview of what you're going to be talking about uh, next week, Lol McShiz? Yes. So next week, I will be talking about how HydroDX is changing the game for treasury liquidity management. So how the Omnipool and some of the features I've spoken about today can be leveraged um, trustlessly by other projects, uh, DAOs, treasuries, um, to, uh, to manage their treasuries in a way that they've not been able to do before. Okay, so in a sentence, it's almost liquidity provisioning for DAOs uh, facilitated by the Omnipool. Yes, because the Omnipool is the ultimate DAO-to-DAO um, liquidity hub. Awesome. Uh, on the same day, we're going to have talks about staking from wallets, uh, from Equilibrium and different DeFi projects and all of the parachains. Uh, there's a link in the chat uh, of this Twitter spaces if you want to find out more about Polka Defiance, uh, which is, I think, the next space where we'll be touching base to chat all things Omnipool, Basilisk, and HydroDX. Uh, so if anyone here wants to register, uh, the link can be on the comments of this Twitter spaces. Uh, and apart from that, uh, Lol McShiz, I'll give the, op the opportunity to provide a parting thought to anybody listening on the call. Uh, if there is a call to action uh, that you would like people to hear that are users of Talisman and need to discover about HydroDX or Basilisk, what would the call to action be? The call to action is please come and use the platform and dump on us all of your feedback, uh, all your thoughts around how to make it more intuitive, features you'd like to see, things that we've done well, things that we've not done so well. Um, you know, this is a, a live product that we're constantly tweaking features to make it as user-friendly as possible. Um, now, clearly, you guys at Talisman are super focused on UX, and that's why I'm an alpha enjoyer of Talisman, because it's you know, changed the game for uh, UX on, um, on the wallet front. Um, we carry the same ethos here um, at HydroX and Basilisk. So please, any ways you feel we can improve or things that you really like, please let us know.